going into battle with fangs, claws, and a lustrous sheen. More Beastmen this month, which means more fur. And seeing as how fur is one of my favorite things to paint, I'm pretty excited about this one. So I want to show off two methods for fur, a simple one and a bit more technical one, which I usually use. But not only that, go over some real life fur colors and see if I can't replicate them. The one page rules Beastmen Brutes are very fuzzy boys, at least around the neck, which means it'll be up to me to add the rest of the texture in. But that's actually what I find fun about fur painting, because it's really easy even though it looks like it should be difficult. I got four of them printed up, one for a simple red fur, then tiger fur, lion fur, and snow leopard fur. I also did a lone Beastmen Hunter, just for some bonus hyena fur too. Start with the simple method, and it starts with two familiar steps. Step one, of course, is going to be a base coat. All of these I'll be doing over a black base coat. Even dark reds like this burnt sienna aren't the most opaque of paint sometimes. So I'm going to do an opacity layer first by adding a bit of gray primer to the sienna and start with that. It'll desaturate the color a bit, but that's all right because step two will bring a lot of that color back. Well, step three technically, because step two is a second thin coat for this base coat. To keep this simple, a wash is a perfectly acceptable next step. It'll be a two for one. Since we added the gray in the base, we'll get the dark back with just the base burnt sienna. But by adding just a bit of red ink or paint, we can get that red tint I'm also looking for in this scheme and a bit of black for darkness. Mixed with some thinner and medium, this just gets washed all over his muscles and fur and left to dry. While not strictly needed, at this point I want to see what it looks like flat. With ink, paint, and mediums, I don't really have a coherent finish to paint over, so I'm just going to do a quick matte layer. This will help me see what I'm doing, but should also help you see what I'm doing. Also at some point I realized I forgot the tail again. And so figure out I'd show you the difference between the saturation between just the base layer with the gray in it and how much the wash added that color back. Now it's actually time to get some of that fur pattern into the fur. And like I was saying earlier, it's really not too hard. To go with my red fur theme, I'm going to use a mix of the burnt sienna, red, and some yellow oxide to get me a red that's just into the orange territory that's also not too light. And the brush I'm going to use is one that's lost a bit of its point. Not because I don't have better brushes, I do, but because I want to show that it's really more about the texture than it is the accuracy of it that gives the look. So anyone thinking, I can't do that, maybe this can give you the confidence that maybe you can. not And all it is, is painting lines down the grain of the body along the shapes of the muscles. It doesn't even have to be sloppy or neat, just random. And don't even worry if it gets into the recesses. As long as it has breaks and frays, it's going to look like fur. The last optional thing we can do to just get a bit of extra realism and texture is to add just a bit more yellow to the last mix and add little stray strands of the hair here and there around the muscles. And be random with it. This muscle gets two, this one gets none, one on this side, and so on. I'll finish it with a bit of matte varnish again so it all becomes one cohesive finish as well. This version turns out quite vibrant, and the orange helps the hair look a little more real than just going with red because hair changes color with light. First off, I know I promised Beastman Brutes at the start of the video, so you might be wondering why I did the first part with one of the warriors. And it was for a personal reason. I love these brute sculpts so much that I really want to do a good job on them, so saved it for the advanced fur. Which uses all the same colors, but different techniques. First one being to use the gray and burnt umber to base coat, but instead of a full base coat, I'll actually be starting the fur pattern with it, drawing in long lines over the black. This will leave the recesses really dark with furs peeking in, and I'll be fixing the darkness thing in a little bit. And like any base coat, the more layers I do, the better the opacity I'll have. So go over some of the areas a few times, and since like I said, I want to do a good job, I'll be using one of my good brushes. Step two is a glaze, with just the burnt umber. 
Before, in the simple methods wash, I used a red and black as well, but here we kept the black of the underlayer, and we'll be building that red through a few more layers, so this is just a way to make the blend between fur and shade a bit more cohesive and saturate the colors again, which is the main difference between a glaze and a wash. Washes are for adding shades, while glazes are about adding or changing color without moving the values around too much or more gradually. Normally I would do this with my airbrush, but I want to show it's perfectly possible with a brush as well. Just keep the mix in the brush thin so it doesn't actually act like a wash. Those two methods, base with a texture and glaze to blend, is pretty much going to cycle all the way up for all the colors now. So for the next layer, it's the fur again with some yellow oxide added to the burnt sienna and gray. Then I paint that over the muscles again with the fur texture. Though this time, I do a little bit shorter fur strands and in more layers. Then for my next glaze color, I just take the color I just did the fur layer in without the gray and add a bit of red. This time I'll use the airbrush to show off my process for that. It starts by adding a few drops of water to the airbrush, then taking just a drop of the already thinned paint and mixing it into those drops of water. Now I know what you might be thinking, no thinner, no medium, and I know, crazy, right? But because I press really lightly with the airflow and barely pull back the needle, I find that I have a much better time with it just using water than thinner or mediums. Because water just dries and evaporates, it can't gunk up the needle tip as it dries by leaving a film or residue behind with the pigment. With water, it's just pigment that I slowly build up over the muscles. The next few steps are really just more of that, so I won't repeat myself too much, but this is where some experience and experimentation come in. I make a lighter mix, paint in some of the fur texture, then if it gets too bright or not red enough, do either a light or heavy glaze to get it to the color I'm expecting, always making the texture congregate towards the light source. Once I'm happy with the buildup of layers, the last thing I do is add some white to my final mix and add stray hairs like I did before, though try and keep myself reined in and cap it to 10 or 11 around the body. Because if I go too heavy, it just becomes another layer. And that's it, just one layer of matte medium to make sure it's all the same finish. It's quite a process with many layers, but once you get the hang of the first two, the rest are all the same. So if you can do just one or two cycles of a base and a glaze, the rest will come naturally. Since the colors used were all the same for both methods, I want to just go about figuring out some colors for other felines. I went with red because I wanted to give my army a bit of a demonic fur look. But there's nothing wrong with taking some inspiration from nature and doing some natural feline colors as well. Let's start with a lion's golden yellow fur and deep brown mane. And I'm not the only one here who thinks that this will look good, as you can see from this preview artwork of the Brute Commander. It has a brown start it looks like, but being the lazy painter I am sometimes, I feel like we can get all his colors from the ones I already brought out. Starting with the Burnt Sieta, I add yellow oxide, then black to turn it into a light, pastelish brown. I want a bit of orange to appear from the lower layers of fur as well, so mix up some burnt sienna and yellow oxide on its own to mix into the brown a bit and do another fur layer. From there, I want to desaturate the yellow oxide a bit, so add some neutral gray to it, and have a bit of the orange just so it's not too bright. Then for the random hairs, just a bit of white into the gray and yellow mix to make it brighter and add those blonde streaks. I left his cheek fur intentionally alone, since we could go full lion and do that the dark brown. I don't think this is going to look that good, but it'll be a nice experiment to see, starting with some black and burnt umber to get me started with a base, then just a pure burnt umber to pick out each of the sculpted hairs, and finally the mixed brown I started the golden fur with just to get those highlights. For the tiger, we're going to need three things, a desaturated orange, white for his belly and cheeks, and his black stripes. And I hate to say it again, but we can use all the same colors still for that. Maybe this should have been about the versatility of a few pigments. I'll lay out the gradient, but it starts with the same brown as the lion. But instead of adding more yellow to lighten it up, we'll use the gray to desaturate the orange instead. I'm only going to do a few layers of the orange, because at some point we're going to have to have white fur blend into that orange fur. 
The undersides of the arms and the belly, as well as the cheeks, are where tigers are white. For the belly, they've got that armor covering, so we just need gray, lighter gray, and white to paint that. But when it comes to the arms and face where there's orange, for the first layer, we want some of the hairs to overlap into that orange. That will give us the base for the white, and we can continue as normal from there. For the stripes, it's just going to be a dark, dark, dark gray. I think a pure black would be too much contrast for me, but it's about the method here. First thing I like to do is paint a thin line to represent the stripes path. Then starting with a small hair at the tip, start to cross stitch it with furs, gradually getting bigger as I go in, but then even for a bit with stray hairs here and there, before thinning at the other end again. We only need a few of these to give the effect, so I'll try not to go overboard on the few exposed parts there are but the top of the head has lots of little stripes parted down the middle, which will definitely sell the effect. For the snow leopard, we already have the color mix since it's the same as the tiger's white fur, dark gray, gray, and white. But when doing the glazing, I add just a bit of brown, in this case, burnt umber, just to give it a little bit of a warm color tint to match our other warm felines a bit more. For the rosette's pattern, just the really, really dark gray again. But instead of stripes, we can start with really thin letter C's. If you think you've messed up a C, you really haven't, as you can close it off and that's also perfectly acceptable in nature. And only a few of those are needed on the more exposed parts of the muscle. Smaller dots are just filled in fully instead to close all the gaps in the pattern. And then we want to paint in the fur, following the grain of the fur, but following the design we made as well. So they won't end up looking like perfect circles, but just a pattern shift between light and dark fur. We can't forget this little guy. Because he's quite a bit smaller, I don't think a fur texture like I did on the Brutes will show up all that well, but a simple one like I did at the start will work just fine. So I'll start him off with a burnt umber, with a tiny bit of yellow oxide mixed in, just to make it slightly brighter and more opaque to start with base coating all of this on his fur. For the wash, it will be the brown and yellow mix with some black added. I like to use black ink because it'll help thin it a bit more, but also have less pigment than a paint, so it will help prevent it from going overboard with too much black. And like any wash, just goes over the base coat until it settles and dries. The last thing is to just get a bit of fur highlights in there, adding some white to the brown and yellow to make it a bit brighter then use a fine brush to add small hairs over all his highlights. I use white because if I were to add more yellow, I think we'd start to lose a lot of the brown. But being that this one's a hyena, I definitely want it to register as brown instead of blonde or yellow. By using the white to lighten it, we don't shift the hue. For his spots, I could do what I did with the snow leopard and use an opaque black to paint in the strands for each spot. But there's a pretty simple way to get fur patterns too, and that still look really good. And that's to use a diluted glaze, but without much thinning. So we disperse the pigment in the medium to make it more transparent, but still get the control of a paint by not thinning the medium. Then just paint in little spots all over his fur. The transparency will let any of the texture through, but still show up as black. So there we have it. Four fur patterns and colors based on real life animals as well as two methods for how to do them. What was surprising to me was just how few colors I used to make them all work. Two browns, yellow oxide, red, and along with black and white did every single one of these, yet they all look really different. And there's plenty of big cats out there I didn't even touch on. Just remember that the simple method can be used for any of these as well. It's all about getting the colors right and the pattern. Anything else is extra. Please subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this one or just other fun things to do with painting miniatures. And until next time, enjoy your own painting journey.